right, good morning, Mission Point family. Oh, that was weak. Come on, we can do better than that. Good morning, Mission Point family. Good morning. Ah, that's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. Now, there's a reason that I wanted y'all to say that with some gusto this morning, and I'll tell you why. So in the beginning, beginning, I can't talk. In the beginning of Genesis, uh, God creates everything in existence within a span of six days. And at the end of each day, he declared that the day was good and that what he had made was good. Now, I think there's a lesson in that. So I believe that words have power. Now, I don't think that we have the power to create anything out of existence, anything into existence out of nothing. Only God has that. But our words do have power. And if you don't believe me, just go ask any random lady on the street how far along she is. (laughs) Now, I don't know about you, but I think that might earn me a slap in the face. So words have power. (laughs) And uh, I say that because I want want us all to, to know and to remember that no matter what's going on in life, if we're suffering or if we're in good times, that we can start our day in agreement with God, that today is good. So, let's say again, one more time, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, yeah. We're in agreement with God, and we're declaring that today is good. And, you know, good things might come our way, bad things might come our way, but we still know that today is good, and that we have our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're new with us, uh, I just want to invite you to uh, look at this, the card in the seat back in front of you. Um, if you're visiting with us, you can fill this out, and I promise we won't spam you, but if you give it back to us, then we can reach out to you and begin a relationship with you if you would like that. Um, most of all, we just thank you for checking us out this morning and worshiping with us this morning. I do have one announcement for everybody. So next Sunday on June 9th, we have a service opportunity uh, for our first responders. So what we'll be doing is we'll just be creating some platters of delicious treats to then go and deliver to our first responders throughout Rutherford County. Now, the last time that we did this, we were able to do it within the city of Murfreesboro, and we delivered to every uh, firehouse station and the police station. This year, this year, we want to expand that into all of Rutherford County. So we're asking that we're able to make 20 platters. And so that would just require all of our volunteers to bring about three dozen treats already sliced next Sunday. Um, and we ask that if you are interested in participating in this, we have a sign-up sheet in the hall back here. Uh, we ask that you please sign up today, even if you don't know what you're going to make. That way we just know how much to expect for next Sunday. We also have, we'll have some volunteers who are going to deliver those, hand, hand deliver those. Um, and last year, I think what they were able to do is just deliver to the locations closest to their home. So that's, it's, so that it's pretty convenient for all of us. Uh, so again, I'll say, if you're interested in participating in that, please sign up today, even if you don't know what you're going to bring. Um, now with that out of the way, I just want to say that, um, we're going to be singing a song here in just a moment called yet not I. And as we're singing that song, I want us to remember what we said about declaring that today is good and that our words have power. In this song, we're going to be singing that God's strength, God strengthens us, that our strength comes through Christ. And no matter what we're going through, we can glorify God by giving him the credit that he's due. And we can remind ourselves that we don't have to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. So will you stand and sing with me as we sing Yet Not I? What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing All is mine, yet not I But through Christ in me The night is dark But I am not 
forsaken for by my side the Savior he will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing for in my need his power is displayed to this I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deep valley he will lead oh the night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me no fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this i hold my sin has been defeated jesus now my plea oh the chains are released I can sing I am free and not I but through Christ in me with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day i know he will renew me until i stand with joy before the throne to this i hold my hope is only jesus complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me yet not I but through Christ in me yet not I but through Christ in me If you'll continue standing, let's read our word of the day, word of scripture today out of Romans 5, 3 through 5. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings out perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. Let's continue in worship. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. He must hold.
me we're going to be in the book of genesis we're continuing there and so we'll be in genesis 40 so you can put your finger there in your copy of scripture because it's always good if you have a copy of scripture with you so you can follow along but we're also going to be i'm going to begin in john chapter 12 uh, and you might wonder why well i'm not going to give you any context which is completely opposite of what a pastor should do or a preacher of telling you why he's reading what he's reading but i just want to read this passage out of john chapter 12 and uh and then we're going to come back to it at the end of the service. And so it might be something that you can chew on and marinate for a little bit of time. And just to kind of let you know, um, so some of you know, when I, when I work on my sermons, I'll, I'll take an opportunity either to come here or there's a place where we used to meet called the Concord Baptist Association. And I'll, I'll still use that facility from time to time to where I do what I call a run through. I like to run through what it is that I'm going to share. I came home and my wife was like, how did it go? I said, it was incredible. I preached for an hour and 20 minutes. It was, it was, it was awesome. Uh, I try to do that one because it allows me to say all the things that I want to say. So that way I don't preach to you for an hour and 20 minutes. I know some of you have told me, quit talking about time. And I apologize for that. Kind of not really. Uh, but at the same time, so uh, I, I've said all these things, but as I was going through and just running through this text, it's, it's really time, honestly, of kind of not just preparation, but worship for me. It's a chance for me to really dive into the text and look at all the different nuances and things that the Lord is kind of teaching and explaining through it. And I'll be honest with you, uh, as I went through it this past week, um, I believe that the Word of God did something that I believe the Word of God is glorious in what it can do. Uh, it, it brought about conviction in my life. 
And the purpose of conviction that the Lord brings into our life is not just to put his thumb on you and make you feel bad. The purpose of conviction is to lead you to repentance. That you would be aware and identify, ah, that's an area of my life that is askew, that has missed the mark, that is sinful. And instead of just sitting in that and feeling guilt and shame, it should move us, the Holy Spirit, hopefully what it does is that conviction moves us to say, Lord, be merciful. Uh, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I confess. Lord, I repent. And that repentance, repentance then hopefully leads us into some kind of action. And it was just, uh, it, it, was, it, was a, it was an enjoyable moment. And so in, in a, to a degree, uh, we had our first Sunday prayer this morning and uh, someone was praying and it was, it was very kind, very humbling, praying for our time this morning and the sermon and that kind of thing. And um, just praying that the, the Lord would work and move and, and transform people and convict people. And I was like, oh, uh, I, I pray the same because I, in some ways I got to kind of have like my own little worship experience on Friday night. And uh, I'm happy out of the overflow of that uh, to invite you in. And so if you would look with me at John chapter 12, uh, you can look there in your scripture, but it, I believe it'll also be on the screen. But John chapter 12, verse 23, it says, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is him basically saying he's about, to, he's about to go to the cross and there's going to be the resurrection. But then he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Let's pray. Father, I'm asking in our time that we get to have this morning that we would recognize uh, the beautiful paradox of losing our life in order to gain it. And Father, I, I would just pray that especially as we might be looking at, at a matter and a, and a subject this morning that could very easily bring about um, memories or hardships within our life that we have gone through or that we are currently going through. And um, I pray that we could, we could hear your voice and sense your presence even in the midst of, of, of a difficult time or a difficult experience. May we know that you're near. And so if, if you would, with your head bowed, your eyes closed, just an attitude of prayer, I want to invite you to pray for one of two things, maybe even both. Would, would you just pray for, for, your, for yourself right now and just ask the Lord, Lord, help me to know that you are here and that you are near. And the second thing I want you to pray is, you may be going through a difficulty or a storm or a hardship in your life and you feel that God is distant. Or you're not in that experience, but you have a friend, a loved one, a coworker who is. Would you be willing to either pray for yourself and or pray for that individual that's on your mind right now that's going through a storm? And would you pray for them that they would know the word of God, that you are near. And finally, if you would, would you pray for me this morning? If you'd be so kind, I'd be humbled if you'd pray. Uh, I woke up a little anxious this morning, which I'm always a little nervous to preach the word, but today was a little different. It, it, it teetered into anxiety. And just pray that uh, the Lord would speak in and through me. Uh, not for my good, but for, for his glory and for your good this morning. Well, Lord, we come to you before we look at your word in depth and ask that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Um, so uh, when I was growing up, the one sport that I never played was baseball. That's actually not true. Uh, there's probably other sports I didn't play, but one of the main sports I didn't play was was baseball. Uh, but my middle brother that uh, you haven't got to meet, and uh, I would love for him and his family to be able to come and visit us at some point, and you can meet Jeff. Uh, he's in between me and, and Chris. Uh, Chris, as many of you have met who's here, he's about six foot one, dark haired, 
green eyes. We look exactly alike. We're almost twins. Uh, and then the middle brother, Jeff, is about six foot one, uh, blue eyes, blonde hair. And there are times where we look pretty, pretty similar until I started getting bigger. And so... Um, Jeff is, uh, is tall and, and skinny, but incredibly fit. Uh, he's a runner. And uh, I would say, and I, this is no offense to Chris, Chris is incredibly athletic, but Jeff, I felt like, was like uh, exceptionally athletic. Like he, he seemed to excel in basketball and baseball and track and cross country. Like he, he just seemed to be a natural athlete in those regard. And I remember he was going to, uh, to baseball practice. I was probably a first or second grader. And uh, my dad and my oldest brother, Chris, myself and Jeff, we, we ride in the car. We drop Jeff off at the batting cages. And I was just so, uh, so excited because I was like, ooh, we're at the batting cages and there's putt-putt over here, like all this thing going on. And so I'm just enjoying myself in that time. And then dad's like, son, we, we got to go. I don't remember what it was, but we got to go. And so I'm like, all right, cool. So we're making our way to the car and my dad goes, oh, I forgot to tell your brother Jeff something. Stephen, will you run back uh, to Jeff? And I, I saw this as an honor of like, yes, I will be your messenger and I will deliver the news. And he said, will you go back and will you tell Jeff? I have no idea what it was. I'm sure it was really important. And I went back and I told Jeff something. And then in a matter of moments of running as fast as I could from that car to the batting cages to deliver this message, I deliver the message. Jeff is like, all right, cool. I'm good. I'm going to hit some, some baseballs now. I ran back to the, to the parking lot, and what do I see? I see the car that is my ride just driving off into the distance. And I was like, you left me. You sent me on a mission to deliver a message, and you've, you left me like you just talked to me. I am your last born. I am precious in your sight. Like, I'm the baby of the... Who could forget Stephen? And so he just drove off, and I was just sitting there, and I was like... Ah! And in that moment when you feel like you have been forgotten because you were, and you have been left behind because you were, I love you, Dad. Uh, and I, I can just remember that moment. You know what didn't come into my mind? Oh, you know what? I will be irrational in this moment. I will not be emotional. My dad will probably realize that, oh, my, my youngest child is not here. I will turn around and he will come back and pick me up. Or my oldest brother, Chris, will say, someone's missing in this car. We should go back and we should go get our youngest brother, Stephen. Or I could have calmed down and been like, you know what? I could go over here with my middle brother, so there's still family here, and I could go and hit some baseballs in the batting cages or do something, but instead, all I could focus on was, you forgot me, you forgot me, you don't love me, you forgot me, like, why would you do this? And, and I did what probably a first grader would do in that moment. I broke down. <laughs> I was scared. I was overwhelmed by the moment, and I didn't handle it very well. Obviously, Dad turned around, and he picked me up, and it's a happy ending, and it's a good story. Like, why, do, why do you share that? I share that because when we're forgotten or we feel forgotten by God, our first and quickest response is just that. You forgot me. You don't love me. You don't care. Are you good? Where are you? I think it's a natural response that we have as human beings. Because today is not intentional to try to... <laughs> A pick at any scab within your life, but I, I feel like what we're about to see isn't going to, it's going to be hard not to look at some of the scars that we've had within our life, or maybe some of the hardship that you're going through, because what we're about to see is Joseph is in literally a dungeon. In fact, specifically in the Hebrews, he's in a pit. He was already in a pit one time when his brothers threw him into a pit and then sold him into slavery. He's in a pit a second time. And this, this isn't, you know, some kind of cushy uh, prison where he gets to go play like shuffle ball later on in the afternoon. I imagine this is dark and damp and hard and harsh. Not the nicest of meals, not the best situation. I would imagine from time to time being even in chains. This is where he finds himself for being faithful and a man of character and integrity. He finds himself in a dungeon. And to give us a little bit of context, because if you haven't been with us or um, if you have uh, slept since last week and you're like, what happened? Let me just remind you a little bit of where we are. Uh, Joseph, uh, as we've been studying thus far the, uh, over the course of this summer sermon series, which is a fun way to say it, uh, Joseph uh, has grown up in a family that has a lot of dysfunction within it. Uh, his 11 older brother, or excuse me, his 10 older brothers hate him. It says that like three times, they hated him. They hated him even more. They're angry with him. They're jealous of him because Jacob, the father of all these sons, loves Joseph the most. 
And what happens is, is there comes a moment where the brothers have an idea that uh, here comes Jacob to come check on us from dad, and we hate him so much, let's murder him. Let's kill him. And one of the brothers, Reuben, the oldest, says, no, 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 let's not kill him. Let's just throw him into a pit. (laughs) Okay. And so they throw him into a pit. And as they do so, apparently Reuben at some point leaves. And then one of the brothers, Judah, he makes the comment and he says, you know what? Let's not kill him because uh, it wouldn't be good. Uh, Let's let's sell him into slavery. Now look how kind we are to him. We're going to kill him, but now we're just going to sell him into slavery. So we're, 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 we're pretty good guys. And they sell him into slavery, and he's taken into chains, and he's just taken off into the land of Egypt to where he's going to go to a land that he doesn't know the language, he doesn't know the people, and he's a 17-year-old boy. Again, I know that this is hard for us to do, especially if you're familiar with the story. Is We can look at Joseph, and you know the end of the story, many of you do, and you're we, we almost look at him in like a legendary status, a mythical status of like, this is all, just kind of like a, a, a tale. And remember, this is real people in a real life situation. And there are going to be macro, like big level things that we need to see about God and the glory of God and his sovereign hand that is guiding the preservation of his chosen people in order that the, the, the Messiah would be born from this nation. Absolutely, we have to see that. But we also need to zoom in and see, here's a 17-year-old boy who was just taken by his family, his own flesh and blood, thrown into a pit, ignored, as it says later on, him crying out, and they just ignore him because their hearts are so hard and callous toward him. Like, I I shared it before a few weeks ago, but I can, it doesn't say it in the text, but I can't help but imagine that as Joseph is being taken off into slavery, and he's kind of looking around, and he's kind of like, guys, are are you done picking on me now? Guys, brothers, Reuben, Judah, Simeon, are you guys, are you serious? Like, you're, you're, you're sending me off into some random place? And as he's on that journey to Egypt, it's not a short trip. There had to be moments where he's riding in the back of a cart, or maybe he's being just having to walk behind a cart, and he's just looking back and wondering, is dad going to come get me? They're going to tell him, like, is someone going to redeem me? Is someone going to rescue me? Instead, he doesn't receive rescue. He gets to go into a slave auction block and be bought by a man by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar buys him, brings him into his household, and it says that the Lord is with him. And the Lord began to bless him, and he began to find favor in the house of Potiphar to where Potiphar was like, man, you are so good at what you do and taking care of my business and giving me profit. I'm putting you in charge of everything. And so Joseph is excelling, granted, in an unfortunate circumstance, but he's still excelling in the circumstance that he does find himself in. So much so that it says later on, it says Joseph was good looking. It's not what it says in the Hebrew. It says he was a handsome man. And Potiphar's wife begins to take notice good-looking guy and incredibly successful at what he does, at what he touches. Hmm. And she begins to pursue him, not subtly either. Her first words and interaction with Joseph is she looks at him and then she just simply says, lie with me. So temptation comes his way. He resists it. He flees it. And he has that moment of where it's like, wow, I said no. I said no to the temptation. I said no to Potiphar's wife. She wanted me, and I said no. I couldn't do this against my master, your husband, Potiphar. That would be wrong. But ultimately, I can't do this because I have a proper understanding and accurate view of who God is. And God would see that this is evil. So therefore, I will not do it. Yes, I'm not going to do it because of my master, but my heavenly father, my heavenly master, I'm definitely not going to betray and violate his standard. Because, hey, you're a married lady. I'm not going to do this. And if it was me in my life, I'd be like, I won. I was victorious. I resisted against the, that, 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 that harlot of a woman. I did such a good job. And so what's my reward now? His reward was, it says, day after day after day, she kept pursuing him. It's, sometimes it's, it's hard to say no and resist temptation. Absolutely. But man, it can, if it keeps coming after you day after day, whew, that's, that's, now that's hard. So Joseph remains faithful, a man of integrity. It says he doesn't listen to her, he doesn't lie with her. And then it seems, Scripture doesn't explicitly say, but it seems that she seems to be a bit of a woman scorned of like, well, if you're not going to come after me, I'm going to try to come after you one more time. But if you don't, I've set up the stage in the scenario that if you don't, all the servants of the house are gone. And she grabs Joseph, he, he resists again, 
grabs his cloak. He runs off. Some commentators think that perhaps he was in his underwear or no clothes at all. Like he's just out of there. He's like, I'm, you're not going to find me. You might take my cloak, but I'm not going to lose my character in this moment. And he runs off. She screams and she begins to present false accusations that this man, I believe, according to the text, raped me. And that's where we pick up. So look at verse 17 of Genesis 39. So now she's speaking to her husband, Potiphar. And she says, the Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came in to me to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now, when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him saying, this is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. Uh, we don't have time to get into it, but I'm curious of, does his anger burn towards Joseph or towards his wife or both? But we don't have time. So Joseph's master took him put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Now, I know some translations use a different word than confined there in verse 20, but uh, I'm reading now the New American Standard. I know Andrew mentioned this a couple of weeks ago when he preached Genesis 38 with Judah and Tamar. New American Standard is a little bit more of a literal word-for-word -word translation. Uh, it's the one that I teach and I preach out of and study out of. And that specific word, at least in the English, uh, it just seemed to just pop off the page because you're going to hear it a few more times here this morning. So he is in the king, the, uh, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Now, it's very similar to what Joseph experienced when he was put and confined into a rough situation, a slave in Potiphar's house, and yet he continues to work and God continues to bless. The Lord is with him. And we see the same thing happen. New circumstance, new experience in a dungeon but the Lord is still with him. And sometimes what we have as Christ followers is, okay, Lord, you're with me, but then why am I in this circumstance and situation? That doesn't seem to compute, God. I, I feel like there's this, there's this idea that I've kind of created that's my own, or maybe within an American version of Christianity, that if I do this, then you're going to bless. Or if I serve you, you're going to be faithful to the extent that I'm not going to go through hardship. Because what I signed up for was uh, <laughs> fluffy giggles in my life and not testing and trials and temptation that would come my way. That's not what I signed up for whenever I gave my life to you. I want heaven, streets of gold, the pearly gates. Like, I want all that stuff. And what Christ comes along and he reveals to us is what we saw before, man. If, if that seed doesn't go into the ground and die, it can never produce anything in its life. And none of us like that story, do we? Until we get to the resurrection. Until we get to the idea of new life and fruit within our life. But sometimes to gain that fruit, to know that fruit, to experience that fruit, the Lord puts us to the test. And in some cases, he puts us to the death. And that is not easy. We don't need to look at this experience of Joseph being in a dungeon and being like, oh, this is a good opportunity for him. It's hard. In the same way, if you're going through hardship, the last thing I want to do is come up to you and go, the, the, the Lord is really teaching you something right now, isn't he? Like, aren't you glad that I told you that? You don't want to hit me in the throat, do you? No, not at all. Like, it's like, no, 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 I'm hurting could you be a little tactful and gracious and be like, you know what? We're in a sin-soaked fallen world. Sin is nasty and destructive. And what you're going through at the hands of another person or another circumstance, that's hard. Like, that's really hard. My heart aches for you. Some of the things that we read within the news that I cannot comprehend. We were honestly praying about this in our, in our prayer time this morning of things that, that I just can't relate to of some like abuse, emotional, physical, sexual, that has taken place, that it's like, oh. So I'm supposed to come along to someone in their life who has been sold as a sex slave in human trafficking and just be like, the Lord is teaching you something in this. It's like, oh. It, can he? Yes. Can he bring good out of anything? Uh, yes. But man, how, do we, how do we navigate this and see God at work within this? As opposed to just coming along and giving 
just simple comments of explanation. Well, I, what I want us to see this morning to begin with is as we get into chapter 40, Joseph is found in the dungeon. And what you're going to see is that, again, Joseph is, is confined within this situation, but though he's confined, he's not constrained. And what I mean is, let's, let's look at it. Verse 1 of chapter 40. It says, It came about after these things that the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And so, again, you guys know that the, the cupbearer was the individual who would be the one who would uh, taste the wine before the, the Pharaoh would drink of it to make sure, one, that it was worthwhile to give to the Pharaoh, that it wasn't some cheap wine, but also that it wasn't poisoned. And so it was a very prestigious and really a place of where you had kind of the king's attention and ear. You can read about a similar circumstance of a cupbearer by the name of Nehemiah in the book of Nehemiah. Like, you, you have access to the king. Like, it's, it's a good position to be in. And the same is true with the chief baker. This is the guy making all the bread for, for Pharaoh, and I'm sure he's testing it and making sure that it's quality and that it's good. Well, these two guys do something that he didn't like. It says, Pharaoh put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was imprisoned. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and it says, and he took care of them. Specifically, literally, he ministered to them. And they were in confinement for some time. So at this point, going even back into Genesis 39, uh, there have been three different times that the place where Joseph is, along with the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, they are confined. They're in confinement. They are confined. And what can happen is when we find ourselves in a, in a circumstance or in a situation that is outside of our control, we can feel incredibly confined. But we have a choice to recognize that though I am confined and I may be a little bit limited in some things that I can do here. It's not like I can just walk out the door and go shop and then come back in to, to the prison. That's not going to happen. But, but I'm not, but what am, what, am, what am I able to do? Like I'm not constrained in every area because it's to the point to where the captain of the bodyguard, the, the warden, if you will, of the prison, again, does the same thing that Potiphar did. He sees Joseph and he's like, man, everything this guy touches, God blesses. And so I'm going to put him in charge of these prisoners. And what we see is that instead of Joseph doing what is a natural thing for me to do, it's like, Lord, I feel like you've abandoned me. Lord, I had false accusations against me. People are lying against me. Like, I haven't done anything wrong. So why would I serve? Why would I continue to work? What does it matter? Like, it's fruitless. It makes, it makes no difference. It seems like the more I am a man of integrity, the further down into the pit I go. And yet what we find here is that he's an individual that continues to serve, literally minister to those who are around him, even when he is confined, because he's not limited to continue to at least be able to do that. He continues to be found reliable in this pit and in this dungeon. And so what we have to do is we have to be careful that Maybe not you, but I have had moments in my life where a storm or hardship has come, and there's almost been a sense and an attitude of, God, until you fix this, I'm staying right here. I will not be moved. <laughs> like, you, you need to move. You, you need to work. I'm not going to submit until you serve me. And that sounds pretty harsh, but that's the way that we behave at times. Is, Lord, what are you going to do to fix this situation, to remedy this situation? And what we find is that Joseph continues to minister and to serve. Some of you may be in a season of life, or you're coming out of one, or you're in one, or you've been in one for longer than you ever expected, and you feel confined. You've received a diagnosis that it's not going to change unless there is a miracle drug or pill that you can take. And some, some of you maybe are in a, in a circumstance uh, that you're, you, can't, you can't erase your past of what has taken place and the harm or the mistreatment that you have experienced that was uh, unfair or unjust. It, it, it carries on with you. And when we find ourselves in those circumstances and we see ourselves in those situations and the experiences that we've had, we are kind of confined within some of that, of like, well, what can I do? And what we find is... We find Joseph being the kind of individual of how can I be faithful with where I am, with what I have, as opposed to looking back and like, oh man, I used to be in Potiphar's house. It was even better then. I thought it was bad then. It actually got worse. 
Or you could look back and when he was being doted on by his father Jacob, like, oh, I'd love to go back to that. But even then, my, my brothers hated me and hated me more and hated me more and were jealous of me. And we can always look to see that that time was better, that circumstance was better. But in the situation you find yourself in now that you're confined in, how do you choose to remain and be faithful? And there's something unique about this idea with Joseph of he's already in charge of all the other prisoners. But it doesn't just say that he's like in charge of them. It says that he ministers to them. He's not just doing his job. He's truly going above and beyond. It's like, how can I serve this individual? How can I serve these people? In fact, uh, I, want, I want to go on and read a couple of more verses. Look at verse 5, and, um, and I want you to see a little bit more of his ministry. It says, in verse 5, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night, and each man with his own dream, and each dream with his own interpretation. And when Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him in confinement in his master's house, Why are your faces so sad today? Then they said to him, We have had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell it to me, please. Again, what you find is that in this moment, he has, he has the ability, it says, to observe them. Sometimes when we're going to meet different people and their needs, it's not just, <laughs> oh, I need to be a minister. It's taking the time to see the people that are around you. To, Joseph is certainly confined in a situation to where he can't go about and maybe be as busy as we might be in certain aspects, but he still, he sees and observes that, hey, you've been in prison with me for a while and I've been ministering to you, but something's off today. Like it probably should have just been, you're probably sad and dejected because you're in prison. But instead he's like, hmm, I know you're sad and dejected because you're in prison and you used to be in the palace with Pharaoh having one of the most prestigious jobs that you could have in your station in life, but something's different about you today. Like, you seem unsettled. Like, there's something off. Like, he has the ability to perceive that and to know that, but he doesn't just keep that within himself. He sees it and he's like, well, I'm here to minister to you. Regardless of my circumstance that I find myself in, I'm going to minister to you. So he asks them the question, why are your faces sad? Can I just tell you on a practical level, there are people within your life that we, we, you don't know what they went through last week or yesterday. I've experienced this far more times than, than I would care to have experienced to where I kind of kick myself later of like, I had no idea that this person was going through this. Are you, are you looking to see individuals and maybe perceive visually or maybe even with your ears of how they speak, how they act, of just the way that their, their countenance looks? of recognizing something seems a little bit off as opposed to leaving it alone. And I get it. We don't want to get into, Oh, hello. We don't want to get into, uh, into people's business per se. But at the same time, what we do want to do is we want to engage with those individuals and be able to recognize you are off. So let me ask you the question, Hey, what's going on? How, how, how can I minister to you today? How could I serve you today? How could I engage with you today? Like, what is it that you need? And, the gentlemen, they have the opportunity to say, hey, we're fine. There's nothing wrong. But they've been disturbed by a couple of dreams that they've had. They've said to, 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 uh, to Joseph, we've had a dream. No one can interpret it. They were bad dreams. We don't know what they mean. And what do we do? And I love that Joseph is the kind of individual that he could have said, oh, I had dreams. I had some really powerful dreams. We read about them back in Genesis 37. Like I, I had these dreams that were able to let me know that I'm, I'm probably going to be in a place of prominence or in a place of prestige a little bit later on. But what's easy for us to do is to be able to, to look at the circumstance and look at the situation and go, okay, well, Joseph, how are you going to handle this? Are you going to make it about you, or are you going to point them to, to God? Because he could have gone back and said, this is all about my dream, my situation, my circumstance. I'm the dreamer of dreams. I can tell you what it means. And he says, no, no, no. My, my view, even in this confined situation where I've been in prison for longer than I would ever have wanted to be in prison, just leave him off. Just leave them off. Just leave them off. All right, cool. So I could be in prison for, uh, for this time, or what I could do is I could say, you know what? Though my dreams, because I would imagine this is how Joseph is feeling. Though my dreams, I thought were going to turn out this way, and they haven't. It's almost like my, <laughs> my dreams have become nightmares. 
his view and his perception of God hasn't wavered. He, and he's not, he, he doesn't need to throw God into this conversation. But because I believe that God is one with him and he knows and senses his presence. And two, because of some kind of foundation that he's received, even within a dysfunctional family in the house of Jacob, he has enough knowledge and understanding of who God is. And he's like, hey, if we want to get to the root of your dreams, then we got to go to the one who can interpret the dreams, God. And I can be used in that fashion. I can be a vessel in which I can be a, an asset to you, to minister to you. And so Chief Cupbearer takes him up on this proposition. Verse 9, it says, He told Joseph his dream, and he said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me. And on the vine there were three branches, and as it was budding, it blo- its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. So I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. So within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind when it goes well with you. And please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews. And even here I have done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon, literally uh, the pit. So he takes the time to listen to the cupbearer's dream and then he interprets it. But when he's finished with the interpretation, he says, hey, but don't don't forget me. It's it's the first time that we've seen that Joseph is like, I'm not guilty. (laughs) My circumstances have been out of my control. I was kidnapped. He doesn't mention his brothers, but that's how he feels. I was kidnapped, taken from my land into a land where I don't know the customs, I don't know the language, I don't know the people. I'm a stranger as a 17-year-old boy being sold into someone's house as a slave. And I, I, but yet this is where I find myself, and I haven't done anything wrong to even be in this prison, let alone a slave. False accusations were presented against me. And so when he shares this, he says, hey, don't forget me. Whenever you're restored, at this point, the chief baker goes, oh, awesome. If you gave, if you gave the cupbearer a good interpretation of his dream, then I want to know what's my dream about. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And so verse 16, when the chief baker saw that he interpreted favorably, he said to Joseph, I also saw in my dream, and behold, there were three baskets of white bread on my head. And in the top basket, there are all sorts of baked food. I imagine Donuts and bagels, and it was delicious. All kinds of different things up there, and the birds were eating them out of the basket of my head. Then Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. So right now the chief baker's like, all right. It's just like the the cupbearer. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and will hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat your flesh off of you. So the chief baker was like, well, that took a dark turn. Uh, I don't like your interpretation, Joseph. You may not like the interpretation, but it's still true nonetheless. In fact, look, look at what it says. It came about, verse 20, on the third day, just as Joseph interpreted, which was Pharaoh's birthday, Then he made a feast for all of his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief cupbearer to his office, and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker just as Joseph had interpreted to them. So Joseph was right on. What's impressive about this is Joseph is obviously, I think, receiving the interpretation from the Lord of both of these individuals' dreams, and he shares it. He just delivers the word. He just delivers the message. This is what it means. It's kind of fun to get up here and to be able to uh, teach of the love and the grace and the mercy of God. That, that's, that's great. I, I, I do enjoy that. But what can be difficult is coming up here and talking about, well, what, what does the Bible teach about d- divorce and remarriage? What, what does the Bible teach about uh, when it, when it comes to sin and judgment and the wrath of God. And what we have is we have circumstances of where it's like, I want to tell you some of the truth of God, but I don't want to tell you all the truth of God because that might make you not want to listen anymore. Or that might make you want to leave. Or you might not like what I have to say. 
And what we can do, if we're not careful, you can be like, oh, okay, well, I get what you're saying. That's for the pastor whenever he's preaching the word at a church and he's preaching the Bible. Like he needs to deliver the whole message, the full counsel of God. Yes, that's true. But the same is true for any one of us who are Christ followers is that we are ambassadors of reconciliation. And so what we know to be true according to the word of God, we remain steadfast and true according to the word of God. And it's not that we are tactless. We are very hopefully tactful, but we are also gracious and loving. And what we do is we look at a situation or a circumstance that if someone is having a difficulty of what it means to understand that scripture teaches they were created male and female, and we're in a culture and society that says, I want to kind of redefine what that looks like, is that we don't look at it and go, well, we're going to be harsh with you and we're going to yell at you and we're going to scream at you. It's like, no, no, no. Here, just, here's, here's the truth. You know, Notice Joseph doesn't come along and just say, he, he delivers it just plain and simple. He doesn't, he doesn't elaborate on it. He doesn't get flowery with it. He doesn't apologize for it either. He's just like, this is how your dream is. This is what your dream is. Like that's, that's just the facts. That's the message. It doesn't mean that it's easy. It's an incredibly, incredibly hard thing to tell the truth at times because sometimes representing God doesn't win you friends. But will you still choose to represent the Lord because you believe and know that this is his word and it's, and it's true? It's a hard thing to do. I believe it was also hard for Joseph in this moment to have a moment of hope. A moment of, okay, God, you, you brought two officials from Pharaoh's court into prison with me, and I get to be in charge of them, and I get to minister to them, and I develop this relationship with them to a point to where they have these bad dreams, and you've already worked with me in dreams, and now I can interpret their dreams, and one of them's going to be restored, and I've already asked them, hey, don't forget me. There had to be this moment of like, oh, the cupbearer, he's out. He's going to be restored. He'll remember me, and then It says in verse 23, the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Again, biblically, remembering is not just like a mental mental, uh, assent or acknowledgement of something. That is an aspect of it. But remembering has a lot to do with putting action to what you remember. I don't believe that it's the cupbearer forgot Joseph. I believe it's more this idea of like, oh, now's not the right time to tell the Pharaoh about the situation. Or, oh, I thought, oh, I forgot, yeah, that guy in prison, Joseph, he told me my dream and he asked me to remember him. I'll do that in the morning. And, and you just, you don't put any action to it. Or like, oh, I've only been back in service for a while. I don't want to bother the Pharaoh with, uh, with this guy in prison that I met. Like, that's not really important right now. And so it's, you're, he refrains from ever sharing with, with Pharaoh. And what you have is that Joseph is forgotten and feels forgotten by the cupbearer. But in this entire time that he has been forgotten and felt forgotten by the cupbearer, he has not been forgotten by the Lord. He hasn't. Now, there may be moments of where he felt like there was hope and I'm going to be delivered maybe soon. But what we find is it says in verse 41, it happened at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. All Joseph has been found is faithful. He interprets this dream when he's confined in this kind of place, remaining faithful, having an accurate biblical view and understanding of who God is. The interpreter of dreams is God. He does the interpretation. He is continuing to serve and to minister. And I can't help but imagine that for Joseph, it was like, okay, they're going to call me up. They're going to call me out. And a day passes and he's like, no, no, no. Okay, they didn't call me today. But you know what? I know God, God, God is like this. It was three days for those guys. It's going to be three days for me. So I'm gonna, on third day, he's going to bring me out of this prison. Third day goes by and he's like, huh, they must have you know, got tied up, you know, drinking that wine and having a good time, you know, maybe tomorrow. And then a couple of weeks goes by, a couple of months go by, six months go by, a full year goes by. Have you ever been in a confined circumstance or situation that is incredibly hard or painful and you're like, this season will pass and you find yourself still in that season? You're like, oh, I've been sick before, but normally like a week later, I feel better. Like I know it's going to eventually end. But this diagnosis doesn't allow that to end unless there's a miraculous movement of the Lord. This circumstance that I find myself in with my family isn't going to change. This financial circumstance that I find myself in, I just seem to kind of be sitting there like, when is it going to change? When are things going to improve? 
When are things are going to begin to, to, to move forward? And Joseph is an individual that it wasn't, it, it's too, I love that the, the writer of Hebrews, Moses, uh, or the writer of Genesis, Moses says it was two, not just years, full years, which leads me to believe that there was probably some interesting stuff that happened in that prison that wasn't easy for Joseph while he was confined in that jail and in that dungeon. It was hard. But yet, I do not believe, though, he was forgotten by the cupbearer, that he was forgotten by the Lord. God provides Joseph the grace to endure this circumstance and this situation. And I believe he does the same for us. And you're like, well, why do you believe that? I want to give to you just a few verses of Scripture from the New Testament. And it's not to proof text them or to cherry pick them. But uh, you can write them down. Uh, but I'm going I'm to read them. The first is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. It says, For this finds favor, or literally, charis, grace. If for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly, for what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God that you would endure even when you have been unjustly and wrongly treated. The the, the second is is what we read in our scripture reading, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Paul writes, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations bring about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The the third is 1 Corinthians 4.12. And we toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. And when we are persecuted, we endure. And then a passage that we've been using this whole sermon series to conclude is Romans 15.4. Whatever was written in earlier times the Old Testament, was written for our instruction so that through perseverance, literally endurance, and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. What this does is this this leads us into kind of our response or so what time. I say that God provides grace for us to endure. What does this grace look like? I think it looks, I think what it looks like is that his grace whether in the high of highs or in the low of lows, whether we're on the mountaintop or we're in the pit or in the dungeon, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, his presence and his word doesn't waver. It's always there. He's gracious enough to give us both of those things. And so, as it says in Romans 15, what is that word of instruction? Or I would even say word of warning. The word of, I would say, instruction or warning that we would have from passage like this is that it's easy to become embittered, angry, disillusioned, or even cynical. Whenever we go through times where you have received undeserved treatment from a family member, maybe as a parent, you've received an unfair treatment, undeserved treatment from your child, or as a parent to a child, vice versa, like you've, you've experienced something that, that was harsh and hard and undeserved, or, or maybe it was an unexpected restriction, again, a diagnosis or a disability, or you're just alone and isolated. Maybe there's an emotional scar that you've had from past abuse in your life. Maybe you've been unfairly accused of something. And when false things are said about you and you have no control over it, that is, personally speaking, one of the most difficult things to try to navigate is, no, that's not who I am and that's not what I said. And yet it permeates throughout a group. Unfair abandonment. When a wife leaves the family or a husband leaves the family or someone's loaned someone money and that person doesn't pay you back and they take advantage of you in that moment. It's, again, easy in those circumstances. It's easy for Joseph within his situation of his confinement to easily become embittered towards God or angry or cynical. I mean, how do we remain hopeful when all hope feels lost? When all you see and hear and feel is despair, loss, depression, and there's no light at the end of the tunnel. The reason why it's so hard is because our feelings and our experiences, at what, what it's doing is it's like it's contradicting. Like what I'm going through is contradicting, I believe, God, your word. 
feel like it's contradicting who you are. I feel like the word says you are good, but how is this good? It says that you redeem, but where's the redemption? It says that you restore, but where's the restoration? Lord, Lord, I can't, I can't see, I can't hear, I can't feel you. You, you say in Scripture you're never going to leave me or forsake me, but I feel forgotten. I feel forsaken. The experience that you're going through is so loud, you can't hear God's word, and the feeling or the pain is so blinding, you can't see God's hand in what it is that you're traveling through. That's real. That's real life. That some of you right now are perhaps trying to endure. Or you have a friend or a coworker, and you're like, oh, this doesn't really relate to me. Quit making, it, <laughs> quit making it about you in this moment. Be like a Joseph and minister to those who are around you who may be hurting and struggling and suffering and to see that they're in a sin-soaked world and they're hurting at this time and hopefully, especially in the life of the church, that if I would minister to you, it's not that you're going to pay me back because I ministered to you, so you've got to minister back to me. It's no, no, no. You're my brother or sister in Christ. You're in pain. I'm sorry. That's hard. Help me to minister to you. I know you don't feel that God is near. I know you can't hear his voice right now because the the pain is so loud and so deafening. But man, he is there. Again, it's it's hard, especially at times within our culture, even within our church culture, is because we we, we want God to just simply make us happy or comfortable or secure or everything's hunky-dory. I'm a big fan of hunky-dory. Those are nice times in life. I want to have some hunky-doriness. And I know that's not a word, Tiffany, but I made it up. And so hunky-doriness is going to be hopefully not what you walk away with today. But will we choose despite our experiences, though they are what they are? And will we choose despite our feelings, as powerful as they are, to be reminded that, God, you're the God who brings beauty from ashes. God, you're, you're the God who heals our wounds. God, you're the God who puts us to death in order to bring us to life. God, you're, you're the God who sent your own son to be crucified so that there could be a resurrection. We, we see this, honestly, within the life of Joseph. He just goes further down and down and down and down into slavery and into the pit, and then he's brought out into something that he could have never fathomed. Again, I feel like those dreams that he had as a 17-year-old boy, at this point, whenever he has this interaction with the cupbearer and, the, and the, the baker, he's 28 years old. It's 11 years later since he's been sold into slavery. 11 years. Some of you are like, man, I've been going through it for a month. That month, I know, has been hard. 11 years. And when he has a moment, a glimmer of hope, if I interpreted these dreams, two more years. He's 30 years old. And yet, maybe those dreams he had as a 17-year-old boy are a faint just memory. It's like, I, I, I can't believe that I, I thought that was a thing. Maybe, maybe that really wasn't what God was revealing to me. Like, I kind of question it now. I mean, it's been 13 years. <laughs> it's probably, I probably misinterpreted. I probably heard wrong. And 13 years later, God does only what God can do, which is Ephesians 3. He does more than we could ever ask or imagine possible. But this is where I struggle with this. Whether I want to acknowledge this or not, I think perhaps in the way that where I've been born, the blessings that we've had, the freedoms that we've had, all these different things, there's a big part of me that's kind of like, I think I kind of deserve this. I, I do deserve these freedoms. And I do deserve these blessings. Man, that grace, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy. I've lived a pretty good life. I've been an obedient son for the most part. I've had a little rebellion in my life, but for the most part, I've been pretty hunky-dory. Like, I've tried to live a good life. And so we begin to think, oh, I could imagine and think of some pretty incredible things that God could do for me. And so whenever we do face storms and trials and dungeon experiences, it rocks our world because we've been taught a false theology that God is just wanting to make you happy and just wanting to make you comfortable. And we live based upon our experiences and our feelings, which are not 
bad, but they're not, they're not the truth. They're not the guiding line. They're not the arbiter of our life. It's God and his word. That I would say, regardless of the circumstance, the feeling, the experience, or the situation, I want to see God in this. I'm going to take his word and say, you know what? I believe you will never leave me or forsake me. I feel like you have, but I choose to know and believe you haven't. Because you're the God, the one true God, who brought Joseph all the way down to the dungeon and brought him up to be second in charge of the land of Egypt and be an agent by which the people of God are preserved. But you know what? You've, you've also done that in my life. And if I ever think that it hasn't happened for me or it hasn't happened for Joseph, I can, look to, I can look to Christ. I can look to Jesus. And this isn't just me as a pastor throwing Jesus on the end of a sermon. That's not what this is. If there is anyone who did not deserve what he went through, who was willing to confine himself within human flesh, and take on the form of a man, and go to the cross willingly, that he might be that seed who was put in the ground so that when he dies, what is produced is salvation and forgiveness and atonement for all others who have placed their faith in him for eternity, then that is a God who begins to do something that I could have never thought of or imagined if you gave me a million billion tries to try to figure it out or imagine it. God is beyond that. He does something and he says, I'm going to put my own son to death through crucifixion because you know what's coming next? The resurrection. The resurrection is coming next. So when I wonder, is there any hope when I've received this diagnosis? The answer is there's always hope because I look to the resurrection. It may not be hope within this life on this earth, but I have hope for eternity now and forever. I have hope. I wasn't sure if I was going to mention this or not. So I, I, I didn't mention this to her, but I think she'll be okay with it. So some of you know Tiffany. She had a horrible accident a few years ago, brain issues, and it's, it's changed her. It's affected her life. She, she has permanent brain damage because of that accident. It's a physical diagnosis that continues to have physical, emotional consequences. Like it's it's inescapable. And unless, and prayerfully, by the grace of God, he wants to put his healing hand on her and and take away all that, that's her, her new confined state. In the wrestling match that she or others of you that find yourself in a diagnosis of sorts physically, you feel trapped by some kind of past abuse that you experience that is not unimportant and it is not trivial and it is not small. If you were unfairly touched or treated by someone within your life, then that was unfair, wrong, and evil. And you can feel entrapped in those moments, confined in those moments. And what I don't want you to hear anybody say, especially myself, go, oh, we'll we'll just move on from that. It's to recognize that in the darkest of that moment, it's not a trivial thing to also see and recognize within Scripture that God resurrects. You see, one, one of the most difficult things that I feel like over the last... I would say 20 years that I've wrestled with is when I've had moments of like, God, I feel like you're, (laughs) I hope I can say this, even though it's irreverent. God, I feel like you're wrong in this circumstance. I think you should have done it this way. I know you've never said that ever to the Lord, but I have. And I'm like, I think you should have done it this way. Like that doesn't make sense to me. You know, the desire of our heart. Why, why would you allow Addison to be taken away from us? Like that doesn't make sense to me. We, we lost the triplets. Why would you also take some of Tiffany's faculties from her? That doesn't make sense to me. And sometimes when we go through storms, hardships, confinements that we find ourselves in, the hard thing is not to become so inward focused 
And that's why I think there's something beautiful about when Joseph is confined in his moment, he chooses to continue to minister. Because it doesn't change Joseph's circumstance to continue to minister to the other prisoners who are also confined with him. But, it, but there's something about this that, I, that is perhaps something that is indescribable and hard to just simply explain unless you've done it and experienced it, is that sometimes when you are incredibly hurting and you're capable and able to, to, to have that moment to serve and to minister to others, though it doesn't change your circumstance, there's something about just being obedient with where you are and serving with where you're at that brings some kind of, honestly, in a weird way, like a ministering to, to, to you. And I know the easy thing to do is when we hurt is to pull inward. I mean, if I get cut on my arm, I kind of do, I, I do that. Like, that's just a natural human tendency that we do. And I'm not saying that if you're sick on your, <laughs> if you're sick with the flu, that you get out there and go give some water to the homeless. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about as you continue to kind of heal and recover, it's like, okay, but how can I continue to be a faithful minister of reconciliation regardless I was, I was reading different stories this week of different Christian individuals who've gone through hardship. Many of you know, uh, oh, I'm going to butcher her name, uh, Joni Erica Erickson Tata, para, uh, quadriplegic. That is a sad story. Incredibly athletic and gifted and fit and doing all these different things. And then in a moment through a car accident, like she's gone. And she went to so many different healing services of God, heal me, heal me, heal me. I believe that you can. I know that you're able. Will you heal me? And he's continued to say, no, 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 no. And it's like, well, God, why not? She's being faithful. She's serving you. She's continuing to proclaim the gospel. I don't have the answer. Just like I don't have the answer in some of the things that I've gone through of like, I would have done this. Why are you doing that? But as I have time to process, I'm able to step back and go, okay, God, I believe that regardless of the circumstance, there is ultimate newness that is going to come. There is ultimate resurrection that will take place. So what I would encourage you to do is that whatever season of life, whatever maybe even confinement you find yourself in, will you choose to be and remain faithful? Because some of the saints of old in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith, they were incredibly faithful and they got to experience, if you will, a reward or a blessing for their faithfulness here on this earth. But there are others that as you read through that passage in Hebrews 11, that their faithfulness to God was, their faithfulness of God, what it brought about for them was they were pierced with a sword, they were stoned to death, they were thrown into prison, and they were sawn in two. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's in the same chapter. And we can read that, I'm like, oh, that's hard. The Christians that were martyred in the Colosseum through gladiatorial games or lions or other Christians who've been burned at the stake or told to recant or face death and they choose to not and they, they're, they're killed for their faithfulness. We have people today, Christian brothers and sisters today, that sometimes, again, we don't think outside of ourselves, but there are Christians today right now who are meeting in underground churches, being persecuted physically, and yet they continue to be faithful to the things of God, even though they find themselves confined in a position they probably wouldn't choose. Why? Because all of those individuals, they've counted the cost and they said, it's worth it to lose my life so that I might gain it. Because even if I die, his resurrection power says that I am victorious. Do you have that kind of victory within your soul? What I want you to do is bow your head and close your eyes. I said earlier from Romans 15, there's a word of instruction and there's a word of hope that we would want to leave with today. And the word of hope that I want to provide to you is I just want to invite you to, in your heart, in your mind, or maybe even audibly out loud to yourself where you sit, that you would pray this prayer with me. And if this isn't you, if you're not in a season of being in a pit or a dungeon, maybe you pray this prayer again for a family member or a friend or a coworker or a boss right now that you know they're, they're having a hard time. May this be a word of hope as you pray this prayer. O oh Lord, help me. Help me to see beyond the darkness to see your hand. Help me to fend off bitterness, anger, and cynicism. 
Help me to cling to you and your truth in any and especially within this specific circumstance. Lord, I believe that your word says that you will provide the grace for me to persevere and to endure. So God, would you give me the grace to endure and that when I have moments of despair, depression, or discouragement, that yes, I would look to the cross, but Lord, would I look, would I look to the resurrection? And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you guys would, would you stand? Would you sing with Lauren? And would you just allow this to be a time that I would imagine maybe you've heard some heavier stuff today. Maybe even some things from the past have come up. This is an opportune time to process that and to go to the Lord with it. If you need to visit with someone, pray with someone. I'll be over there. I'd love to visit with you, pray with you. But use this song as she sings as a time to wrestle, process, maybe with some of the confinement that you're experiencing even this morning. But take that time. my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father and trees of skies and seas his hand the wonders wore. this is my father's word oh God is the ruler, yeah. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is King, let the heavens reign. God reigns, let the Father's world, though soiled by our sin, creation groans for God alone, can liberate us from within.
Uh, if you guys would, you don't have to take a seat because I'm going to be super fast. We'll be dismissed. Just two things I want you to be aware of. End of the month uh, at the Nailers, Lord willing, uh, they still want to they want to host uh, at their home our annual fireworks thing. I know uh, if you would continue to pray for Kirk and Karen. Uh, Kirk is feeling better, uh, but Karen could also use some prayer. She's had a kind of a down week physically, so continue to pray for them. But they would like to uh, to to continue to host this year if at all possible. That's the plan. But uh, that's coming up at the end of the month, Friday, June twenty eighth, and then. Um, the other is the announcement that Dalton had made our ministry to our first responders here within Rutherford County. I just want to ask you that uh, before you go, uh, if you are like, I don't know what I'm going to bring, but I'm, I want to participate. They're just asking that you would sign up so that we have an idea of kind of what to expect. So maybe the first thing you do uh, whenever you're dismissed in just a couple of seconds is that you would just go to the, the bulletin board and just sign up and put uh, your name and then I don't know. And then next week you bring that thing that you didn't know about and uh then we'll have a chance to take, to deliver those next week, which I think is the, is, is the best part is actually delivering them to maybe the fire station or police station that's nearest your home and just ministering to those that are next to you. But with that being said, appreciate you guys. Love you guys. You are dismissed and we hope to see you next week.